All right, guys, now that we've talked about different types of studies that you might encounter while you're doing your research paper, let's actually crack into some primary research. So this is the article that I have selected. It is entitled, Activation of Phasic Pontine Wave Generator Prevents Rapid Eye Movement Sleep Deprivation Induced Learning Impairment in the Rat, a Mechanism for Sleep-Dependent Plasticity, which is... Again, not a catchy title, the kind of a theme with scientific papers, uh, but it is a very informative title. So what is this title saying? Well, it's giving us some information. This is about sleep deprivation induced learning impairments. So the way that sleep deprivation causes issues with memory, learning impairments. What kind of subjects are we using? We're using rats. Uh, and there's some neuroscience going on here. The pontine wave generator. When I first read this article, I didn't know what the pontine wave generator was, but I did know the word pontine. I knew that had to do something with the pons, which is a structure uh, in the brainstem. So I, I knew what that was. And rapid eye movement sleep, that's a, that's a stage of sleep when you're dreaming. So I knew that part. So even though I didn't, uh, when I first read this article, I didn't know what every single part of this title meant. I kind of saw where it was going. And as I read through a few more times and I, I tried it, then I went back and I started reading these again. And I was like, ah, oh, okay, now I get what this paper's about. Now the title is one clue that this is uh, a scientific paper and primary research. Another good clue is that it's published in the Journal of Neuroscience. Uh, so not every journal has the word journal in its name. For example, uh, some of the biggest journals that you guys will see are Cell and Science and Nature. And even though we call them the Journal Science and the Journal Cell and the Journal Nature, uh, they don't have the word journal in their name, but they will still have the same kind of formatting uh, usually up at the top, it will say the title of it, it'll have a date, and it'll give you a volume number, an issue number, and a page range for finding this article. Because often these articles are downloaded as separate files, but you would need to know how to cite that article. So you need to know where it actually is in the issue number or the volume number. Uh, of the original publication, which is not information that would be listed in, say, a periodical, uh, like a newspaper or something like that. You would just look at the page number of the newspaper that, that you're on, or you would use the web address for the link that you were uh, reading it from. So the fact that they know that this is something that's going to be cited and that they need to put that information up, pretty good clue right there. So it comes from a neuroscience journal, not from the New York Times or you know, uh, Fox News or ABC or CBS or anything like that. It's coming from a scientific journal and it's got a title like this, pretty good indication. It might not be primary research though. It's it, that so far what we know it's the scientific paper, but it might not be primary research. So we dig a little deeper. Now every paper that you read is gonna be cut up into specific sections. So let's talk about those. First of all, we've already talked about this bit, the title. The title uh, will give a reasonable description of the study. It'll include the species studied, rats. It'll include the kinds of experiments performed. Well, we know that this involved the phasic pontine wave generator, and we know that they activated that, so they activated some sort of brain structure inside of a rat. That probably means electrodes were used, uh, and that there, this was a learning experiment, so they were probably doing some sort of learning trials uh, on the rat as well, and they were inducing sleep deprivation. And perhaps a brief indication of the results obtained. Uh, activation of this brain structure prevents rapid eye movement sleep deprivation induced learning impairment. So turning on this brain structure 
prevented the kind of problems that would usually be associated with sleep deprivation uh, on these learning trials. So that's what this title is saying. Very complicated sentence, uh, but once you go through it a few times, you say, oh, okay, I, I see what it's saying. Next section, the authors would be the next section, but next section after that, the abstract of the paper. Abstracts are often free, excellent. And most of what you'll be doing when you're looking for research papers is reading abstracts. You do not need to read the entire paper before you decide whether or not it's something you wanna include in your research paper. Most scientists don't do that when they're looking for things. That's what the abstract is for. You read the abstract and then you decide is that something that I'm interested in or is it not something I'm interested in? If the abstract sounds interesting, request a copy of that paper from the library or if it has a free PDF download, download a copy of that PDF, put it in a folder, that's your maybe pile for, for um, papers that you might wanna read. Uh, and then go through that maybe pile once you've gotten a few of them and say which, which ones do I find the most interesting of my maybe pile here? So the abstract provides a summary of the entire paper. It's gonna tell you all about the experiment, including the results, right? So it's, it's spoilers included. Uh, they, they don't have the same approach of like, it's not like the back of the book blurb when you're looking for a novel uh, in the bookstore. This will give you a lot of information, but if you are looking for a deep understanding of how the experiment was done, it won't give you enough for that. You need the method section for that. You need the results section. You need the uh, analysis section and the conclusion section in order to really understand what the scientists were thinking. Okay, so the abstract is a summary of the overall paper, usually about a paragraph long. Introduction. The introduction gives you relevant background information and context necessary to understand the present study. So they don't wanna to just toss people in at the deep end because often even if you are in a particular field, uh, like you, even if you are a neuroscientist, you might not be a neuroscientist who specifically studies the effect of the pons on rapid eye movement, sleep deprivation, and learning impairments, right? So you are going to need a little bit of background to bring you up to date enough to understand what it is they're doing in the experiment. So they're gonna tell you about any experiments that this particular team has done previously, or experiments that other teams have done previously, and then they're taking the next step or they'll tell you just generally about uh, this field so that you have a little bit of something to go on. So when you read the introduction, they're gonna give you really important information that you'll need. Uh, when you read the introduction, I would suggest that every time they introduce a, an abbreviation, like right here, right here you can see that they write rapid eye movement, parentheses REM, anytime they do that, highlight that, write it down on a separate sheet of paper uh, and write down what it means. When they introduce abbreviations, it usually means they're gonna use them continuously throughout the rest of the paper and you are going to want a cheat sheet of what those abbreviations mean. It will make reading the rest of the paper so much easier. Here's another example right here. During REM sleep and in, and in part of slow wave sleep, SWS. So from now on in the paper, they might just say SWS and not slow wave sleep. But if you have your cheat sheet, you'll, you'll be on the same page, right? You won't get confused when they just start throwing that out there. So the introduction is gonna be your primer for giving you the information you need in order to read the rest of the paper. So this is the introduction, uh, or at least part of the introduction for that paper. And you can see it's very, very jargony. God, there's, there's, uh, there's so many abbreviations and you can see that there are citations every few moments here and it looks like it would just be a nightmare to read your way through, but it's not as bad as it looks if we read it strategically. So first thing, 
we're just gonna fade out all of that citation information. Not that it's not important, but it's not important for reading it, right? For getting information out of the paper. And you remove that, well, then it, oh, okay, this becomes a much easier thing to look at. And look at that, the sentences are nice and broken up into little different parts for us. So, what do we got here? Behavioral studies of learning and memory in both humans and animals provide considerable evidence to support the hypothesis that post-training rapid eye movement, REM, sleep is critical for and is the most favorable behavioral state for memory processing and improvement of learning. Okay, that's not too jargony at all, actually. This, what they're saying is after you've trained in a task, you want to get rapid eye movement sleep. That uh, if you have a good night of sleep at, following training in some task, that you will see improvements in that task following that sleep. That, that's going to help you retain uh, that skill that you've learned there. Now, why did I highlight this? Well, it's an abbreviation that they've introduced, so I would say write that down and write down the definition of that abbreviation. And this might be a term that maybe you're not familiar with, rapid eye movement sleep. So look up what is rapid eye movement sleep and put that down in your list of uh, new terms to learn because you're going to need to learn a whole bunch of new vocabulary to read these papers. In the reading papers strategically packet uh, that I've put onto uh, the, the research paper files, uh, it's one of the submissions that you have to turn in. One of the things that I ask you to do is to go through the introduction and write down, I think, 10 new vocabulary words that you find there and write out their definition. So this is part of the process, is just learning the jargon and translating it as you go through. Okay, so what is rapid eye movement sleep? Well, as you are going through sleep, you go through a series of sleep stages. So periodically you end up in rapid eye movement sleep, which is usually the, the stage that we associate with like dreaming. And some studies have shown that rapid eye movement sleep has really strong associations with learning. Another thing that they talk about in this paper is slow wave sleep, which are down here. You can see these really deep layers of sleep here. So this is another uh, thing that they talk about in this paper. Now, this is not a video about uh, that topic, so I won't go too deep into it. It's just a video about reading research. Other studies have demonstrated that REM sleep is critical for neuronal plasticity. That would be a term that you'd want to go out and define now, which is cri a critical mechanism for memory processing. Different classes of memory formation appear to be processed by distinct memory systems in the brain. Different classes of memory formation. What the, what the heck is that? So you might want to go out and look up that information. So we can divide memory into declarative and non-declarative memory. And then we can talk about all the different kinds of memory, so associative and non-associative memory. We can talk about procedural memory, what you might think about as uh, like uh, muscle memory, that sort of thing, semantic memory, so um, things like remembering words uh, and, and just sort of trivia facts and episodic memory, your, your memories of things that have happened. So you have all these different classes of memory, and that's what they're talking about there. Many recent studies have shown that the amygdala and hippocampus, good terms to look up, what are those, may be platforms for sleep-dependent memory processing. Amygdala, hippocampus, two structures in the brain. Although the amygdala, hippocampus, and possibly some other parts of the cerebral cortex, another part of the brain, process acquired information, it is not clear how REM sleep regulating structures influence the way the hippocampus and amygdala process the information. During REM sleep and in part of slow wave sleep, phasic field potentials called pontine waves, P waves, introducing an abbreviation, are generated in the pons. Ah, 
Okay, so here we're talking about brain waves. We're talking about the different waves that are generated uh, at different points in sleep. And we're talking about these different brain structures. This is part of your brain stem here. This is the pons, this little kind of lump on your brain stem. So this is part of, of it's right where your, your spinal cord is meeting uh, your brain. It's right over here with the medulla oblongata. Uh, and they're saying that a structure in the pons is generating a phasic field potential brain wave that we call a P wave. And that these field potentials are reflective of phasic activation of a specific group of cells in the pons, so it's from there. It has been demonstrated that the functionally identified P wave generator cells project to the hippocampus and amygdala. So there's a relationship between this series of cells that they're calling the P wave generator that is found in the pons and these two structures that we know are associated with memory processing. Behavioral studies have shown that sleep-dependent improvement in learning is positively correlated with P-wave activity during REM sleep. Ah, so there's already some studies that say that there's something going on between these P-waves and memory processing uh, and correlating it with this sleeping behavior. So, okay, we already got some groundwork laid. Together, these anatomical and behavioral studies indicate that the activ that activation of the P-wave generator might be involved in REM-dependent memory processing in the rat. Okay. Whew. To understand the role of the P-wave generator activity in REM sleep-dependent learning and memory processing, the first task of the present study was to develop a a method to selectively deprive REM sleep without disrupting slow wave sleep. So they wanted to make sure that they were only disrupting that one form of sleep. Notice how important it was that we figured out what some of this jargon meant, that we figured out REM sleep and slow wave sleep and what these brainwave uh, things all were in order to understand what the point of the present study was going to be. All right. So selective sleep deprivation on learning performance. We evaluated rat performance uh, deficits immediately after training trials and REM sleep deprivation in relation to rats that received training followed by experimentally induced P wave generator activity and REM sleep deprivation. So they uh, caused rats to be sleep deprived. They had a control group that got normal sleep uh, and, and we're fine. They got, uh, they had some rats that were sleep deprived and they had some rats that were sleep deprived, but they artificially stimulated this portion of their brain that normally would only have been active while they were in REM sleep. And they wanted to see if artificially turning this part of their brain on even though they didn't get any REM sleep, would um, make up for the deficit in, in learning that the other rats would, uh, would have had, right? So that's what this experiment was about. Can switching on this group of cells, this P wave generator, make up for REM sleep deprivation? Okay, so I like, of course, you guys know I like pictures. So here's what we have. We have we have some rats that are going to be well rested and we are going to then subject them to memory tests and see how well they learn. Other rats will be sleep deprived and we're going to subject them to memory tests. Other rats are going to be sleep deprived, but we're going to do something to their brain and see how well they learn. Materials and methods. Now this is going to be uh, the place where they explain exactly how the experiment was conducted. So they're going to give you all of the nitty gritty details. This is by far the most technical and difficult to read portion of the study. And if you are just interested in results, a lot of times people will just skip the materials and methods section. But couple things. One, if you are looking for primary research, 
look for a materials and methods section. If there is a materials and methods section, then there's a really, really high chance that this is a primary research article. If there is not a materials and methods section, then you probably do not have a primary research article. That, I'm going to say, is the highest yield indicator uh, that you are going to look for. Materials and methods, that's going to be our, our key there because if there's no materials and methods then there probably wasn't any kind of experiment uh, being conducted the other thing is that uh, I th even though it's the most technical and difficult to read I think it's one of the most interesting parts of the paper to read if you can take the time to decrypt the jargon, because this is where they actually tell you how they did the experiment. This is where they actually say what was going on. They're not just going to give you the numbers and the results and the statistics. They're going to tell you how they set it up and what they did, right? This is this is why I'm reading the paper, is to find out what kind of cool scientific experiments happened. So I want you guys to, to at least make a good go at reading the materials and methods section. When reading the methods section, focus on answering a few big questions. What kind of organism was being studied? They'll tell you. That, that'll be an easy one. How many? And they will report this as N equals. N is the sample size. is the number of subjects. Were they divided into experimental and control groups? Any properly designed experiment should have experimental and control groups, but in the last video we talked about how maybe that's not, maybe that the, the, the study design just prohibited that kind of uh, treatment. How were the, if they were divided into those two groups, how were these groups treated differently? How was data collected? Was it measured with a measuring tape? Was it uh, was it uh, taken with uh, some sort of large device that uh, you know, like a reader, some, some sort of you know wand that scans them and does it? Did they had to dissect the animals' brains in or in order to get the data? Did, were they weighed at the end of it? You know, what, how did they get the data at the end of this process? Then. Write a simplified experimental design in your own words. That really helps understand the experiment. Try to strip away their jargon and say, ah, okay, I get it. They built a box. They put this in the box. Here's where they put this. Here's where they put this. If this happened, X. If this happened, Y. That's their experimental setup. Okay. Now, Read the section again and try to add a little bit more detail to your description. You'll notice that a lot of my suggestions for how to read these papers involve reading again. I think after you write down all of your terms and your abbreviations in the introduction section, you should read it through again to see if you understand the abstract in the introduction a little bit more clearly. So in my example paper, uh, Data and All 2003, they experimented on 30 male sprog dolly rats. What's a sprog dolly rat? That is a sprog dolly rat. It's a normal white lab rat. Just like we have different breeds of dogs, lab rats come in different breeds. And if you have them all the same breed, then that is kind of controlling for any kind of genetic differences that might pop in. You don't want a really diverse lab rat population. You want them as similar as they can possibly be. So they have 30 male sprog dolly rats. For a neuroscience paper, a sample size of 30 is, is pretty decent. Like they're going to get some really rigorous uh, controlled results. So 30 works just fine. Then they said they're going to use chronic implantation in order to record measurements. And I said, what's chronic implantation? That sounds interesting. This is chronic implantation. This is from a different paper, but it's the same kind of idea. It means that basically they wired sensor electrodes, recording electrodes, into the rat's uh, brain in order to get information and record it, right? So this is what I mean, like if you translate the jargon, 
suddenly you find inf- it, like fascinating information coming out of this. Like the the experiment becomes so much more vivid and alive uh, when you realize that words like this hide really interesting things like this, really interesting pictures. And you can find, um, sometimes from other experiments, but you can find images of these kinds of things. Uh, another thing was that they used a stainless steel tube uh, and they implanted that in order to deliver either saline solution or carbacol solution into the lab rats' brains. Saline for the control group and carbacol for the ones whose P wave um, uh, generator was going to be activated. Carbacol is a chemical which mimics certain neurotransmitters, so it was basically there to turn on the P wave generator. Okay, so they couldn't just they couldn't only put the steel tube into the uh, brains of the ones that they are going to inject because then we have an additional variable of the steel tube. They had to try to match conditions as evenly as possible between the control group and the experimental group. So they both get the steel tube and they both get an injection, but the difference is what they're being injected with. One saline and then the other one this chemical which turns on the P wave generator. They divided the rats into three groups. We had the normal sleep control group. These ones were allowed to sleep and achieve REM sleep after training, and they were injected with saline. So they uh, they they had the electrodes and everything just like everyone else, but they were getting normal sleep and saline injections, 10 of those rats. Then we had the sleep deprived group, but they were sleep deprived and uh, in a control group as well. So we have two different controls here and they uh, were not given the activation. So they, uh, this is another 10 uh, lab rats in this group as well. And again, th these were described with abbreviations throughout the paper. So my little cheat sheet, which told me that NSC means normal sleep control group and RSD means REM sleep deprived and RSDPA means REM sleep deprived P wave, genera uh, P -wave generator activated uh, was very helpful in being able to understand the paper. So, and then we have the last group who were REM sleep deprived, but they got the injection which turns on their P wave generator. Uh, that's our third, that's our experimental group. Once you get done with your methods section, then you're going to end up in the results section. And the results section, the tables and graphs are the stars of the show. That's where all your big important information is going to be contained. Uh, but make sure that you read the captions below your figures before you try to understand what it is the figures are trying to show you because sometimes if you just jump straight into it, uh, you think it's saying one thing, but then later you read the caption, you realize, oh, it was saying something very, very different uh, indeed. So make sure you read the captions uh, beforehand. Now this one I selected sp almost specifically because it was uh, straightforward. It's just showing you the different groups of rats and their performance across each of the trials as the experiment went on. So it's just showing you how well they did over time. But it does give us an opportunity to talk about a different aspect of scientific studies, plotting your results on a table. You have two different kinds of variables, the independent variable and the dependent variable. Independent variable is often controlled directly by the experimenter or it is simply not affected by the dependent variable. So time and temperature is something that uh, you don't necessarily uh, control, uh, like the progress of time, but you do kind of. You control how long the experiment goes on for. And temperature, uh, you might be making an observational study where you're uh, you're just recording the temperature, but you might be doing something where you're checking growth rate and you actually are controlling what the temperature is at various points. So these are things that the experimenter kind of controls. And here, blocks of trials, how many trials there have been, that is something that we control. 
And in other types of studies, you might just have uh, a bar graph where you're displaying the data. And on the left hand side, it's the control group. On the right hand side, it is the experimental group. But the fact that there are two groups is something that we had control over as the experimenters are. So that's part of the independent variable and that goes on the x axis. Dependent variable is not something we have control over, something that we measure instead. So that goes on the y axis. It responds to changes in the independent variable. So growth rate would be an example of a dependent variable. Their performance on this test is, an, is a dependent variable here. So they've done this properly. Independent variable on the x axis, dependent variable on the y axis. And how did the rats do? Well, we have these downward triangles here. These are the uh, regular sleep rats, okay? And you can see that they had steady improvement in their performance, and by the end of the block of trials, they had, ooh, about 80% avoidance rate there. Uh, and then here we have our rats, these uh, open uh, circles. These are rats who were sleep deprived but given saline injections and you can see that their performance really dropped off over time uh, and you can probably relate uh, to this type of situation when you're sleep deprived and your uh, ability to learn new tasks go drops off really substantially. These S's and asterisks are uh, references to the statistical significance of each of these figures, uh, comparing them between uh, trials and test runs and between different groups and things like that. And, and that information is specified in the uh, figure captioned below the table. Now, the dark circle here is our sleep-deprived group with Carbacol injection, with the P-Wave generator activated. And you can see that they also had steady improvements in their learning, in their avoidance. In fact, look at this, they ended up way up here. Uh, now, that's uh, the error bars kind of overlap here. So yeah, they're, they're, they're up doing about as well as the, uh, the rats who had a full night of sleep here at the end of this trial. So what does this tell us? No need to sleep. Just inject some Carbacol directly into your brainstem, and you can and you can stay out all night, and you'll be able to uh, remember everything for the test the next day. Uh, probably not the results we're looking for, but it does teach us something about uh, our brains, doesn't it? Now that's the results, uh, and sometimes the results and analysis are kind of uh, put together, but. Every paper is going to have a statistical analysis towards the end, so I want to talk a little bit about statistics, because you'll see some very unusual statements there, but I guarantee these will be in every single paper that you see. So, imagine that we have a coin and we want to flip it five times, right? Assuming that this is a fair coin, how many times would you expect it to flip heads? Uh, you, you probably say something like two times or three times, right? Maybe two and a half times, but you might say something like 50% of the time, right? Or 0.5 might be a way to say that because you know that that to calculate a percent you you get a decimal and then you just move it two points over and then put a little percent sign right so 0.5 is how often I would expect to get heads assuming it's a fair coin but if we run this experiment what if we get five heads and zero tails is that possible with a fair coin? I mean, it's possible. It's possible that that could happen by random chance. Is it suspicious? Mm, I've seen it happen before. You probably have too. If you've ever just sit there flipping a coin, you've probably seen five heads in a row. Um, is it a trick coin? Maybe. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. How certain could we be? B. How weird is that possibility? Well, let's let's take a look at that for a second. 
So let's say we have a coin. We want to know if it's a trick coin, right? So we have here we're at 100% possibility right now. We flip the coin once and we know that uh, if we divide this by two, we get the odds of it being heads uh, one time, right? 50% odds. Now, if we divide it, we flip it again, then the odds of it showing up heads twice, 25%. If we flip it again three times, the odds of it showing up heads three times, 12.5. The odds of it showing up heads four times in a row, about 6.25%. The odds of this coin showing up heads five times in a row, about 3.125%. Uh, okay, keep that in mind. It's less, it's a little bit more than 3% uh, to get, if, to pick up a random coin and say, I'm going to flip this five heads in a row and then flip five heads in a row. The odds of that happening by chance are a little bit better than 3%. When a study says we have found stati a statistically significant difference in the blood cholesterol between the control group and the experimental group, they will put something at the end. It'll say something like P is less than 0 0.05. What they are saying is that that result that we got was so statistically unlikely that we calculate that it would happen by random chance in a just a normally distributed population, it would happen by random chance about 5% of the time. Remember that the odds of picking up a random coin saying I'm going to flip five heads in a row and then flipping five heads in a row was just better than 3%. So what they're saying is that it was something interesting. It was statistically significant. It's not absolute though, it's just interesting. We're saying that this is an important enough result to warrant further investigation, but we haven't conclusively proved it. We've just pushed the, um, the field a little bit further in that direction, okay? The authors are stating that they performed some statistical test and that the results would occur less than 5% of the time without a difference between the groups. P-values of less than 0.05 uh, of 0.05 or less are considered significant for most experiments in biology, though not always. Some areas uh, have harsher requirements. They might require 0.01, they would require it to occur by chance less than 1% of the time, okay? Uh, if you if you like reading about science and things like that, you may have uh, heard about the search for uh, exotic particles and things like that, the Higgs boson, uh, and when that was detected, uh, they it came up with uh, Six Sigma certain it went past five Sigma it went to six Sigma certainty. I'm pretty sure uh, and that is the equivalent of like P less than point zero 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 like some absurd degree uh, of scientific certainty like way past anything that any experiment I've ever been involved with could possibly have uh, have managed so different fields use different standards of statistical certainty uh, but when you see this, and you will see these these things, these p-values in your papers, uh, that is what they are saying, is that it's statistically certain if it's less than this number. So if it says p less than 0 0.05, they're saying it's, it's a result, it's a good result. And they will also talk about common statistical tests that they may have used in order to find that result. So if you see any of these words, what they're just talking about is the specific math that they did in order to find that p-value. So t-tests, comparing two lists of numbers, two, two lists of data. ANOVA, analysis of variance. MANOVA, multiple analysis of variance. Chi-squared, many others, Man, Whitney, you, a uh, bunch of uh, other types of things you could do.
For our class, you do not need to understand the mathematics behind the tests. You just need to know that when they say these things, they're telling you that they did the math and then understand what a p-value is. So they're just telling you how significant the result is. Then when you get finished with the results section, you will be moving on to the discussion and conclusion section, which caps off every scientific paper. Uh, this is where they will talk about their interpretation of the data. There's no interpretation in the results section. It's just talking numbers. It's just talking shop. Uh, they are not going to tell you what the numbers mean. They're just going to give you the data. The discussion and conclusion is where they save all of the opining about the importance of their findings. Uh, or they suggest f uh, directions for future research. They talk about their interpretation of the data and uh, they might talk about uh, how it fits into other areas of research and what it indicates. They might even talk about where what they think the limitations of their own studies are uh, and what they might do next time. Uh, so one of the main findings of the paper that I was looking at Carbacol injection after training trials prevented REM sleep depri deprivation induced deficits in learning improvement. It seemed to uh, counteract the effects of REM sleep deprivation. That is a fascinating result. Uh, and I have not checked to see what this team has done since then. And I actually, you know what, not after I finish this video, I probably will now that I'm thinking about it again. So you will be submitting work in uh, uh, five stages. You will be choosing your research topic, summarizing the background information for this field, doing your own independent research. You can uh, look around everywhere uh, you can. Find and summarize current event and periodicals on the subject. So you're gonna look up some, some periodicals, find something from Scientific American, find something from National Geographic, find something from New York Times. You know, someone has written some accessible uh, news articles about these topics, see what, what, what those science journalists have said about it, uh, and that might help you uh, to write your own paper about this. There you go. Submit scholarly sources. So once you have gone through and you found your sources, you are going to need to email me full text PDFs of those sources. Do not send me links. And it needs to be at least two peer-reviewed primary research articles, full text PDF required, and a published review paper on that topic, PDF full text required. Uh, one way that you could go about this, look for a review paper that is accessible to read, that gives you good background information on this topic, and then look for the most interesting studies that are discussed in that review paper, and then try to find those studies and use those as your research articles. Because uh, this will give you a little bit of insight as to how those papers fit into the broader literature, and then you can take a deep dive into those articles. Then you will be completing the Reading Research Strategically packet for one of your primary research articles that you have selected. The reason why I'm having you select two is so that you have a fallback in case you decide that your other one is not, you know what, I thought it was good, but mm, so I want you to have a second option to go to here. Uh, and also this tells me that you've read multiple abstracts and you just didn't just pick the first thing uh, that came to mind. The Reading Research Strategically Packet takes a lot of the tips that I just went through and a lot of the stuff I was just talking about and it uh, just turns it into a worksheet. So translating the jargon is one step in it and uh, writing down the t basically the citation information for the paper is another step and uh, looking at the graphs and tables is another step. And then submit your final research paper. That is the fifth step. So I, I did get some emails from people saying, hey, when, when is this due? And that information is listed in your uh, course uh, schedule. Uh, the only reason I'm not saying it right now is because I would like to leave this video up for future semesters. So I want it to be omni-applicable. Uh, but 
uh, it's it's listed there, but just knowing when the final research paper is due is not sufficient because uh, about half of the grade is these other submissions as well. Uh, maybe a little bit less than half of the grades, just these other submissions as well. So you want to be on top of this. All right, I will see you guys next time. I know this was a long one. <laughs>